Welcome to the Reduce Cyber Risk Podcast, where we provide you the training and tools you need for your cybersecurity career. Hi, my name is Sean Gerber, and I'm your host for this action-packed, informative podcast. Join me each week as I provide the information you need to grow your cybersecurity knowledge while taking practical and actionable steps to protect your business from the evil hacker horde. All right, let's get started. All right, welcome to the Reduce Cyber Risk Broadcast. Our podcast here we got set up for January 28th, 2019. Hope everybody's doing well. And we're going to be putting some, we have some great stuff to put together today in today's uh, broadcast. And it's going to be around the different cybersecurity stuff that's going on, different news that's in the, in the news as well. And along with some cybersecurity training around understanding cybersecurity frameworks. So the news, what we're going to talk about is Colorado police encrypt their communications, DHS issues emergency directives, stages of the CISO or Chief Information Security Officer's success, and then finally we'll talk about security training for cybersecurity frameworks. So this will be part one. All right, let's get going. All right, so in the cybersecurity news, uh, a lot of things happening lately. Um, but these are actually some that aren't the typical, you know, the, the sky is falling and we're going to lose everything because everything's encrypted and uh, long live the hacker. No, uh, we're not doing that this this round. We're actually going to have some different interesting things that I thought was kind of uh, telling in the fact that uh, the, the world is changing dramatically. Uh, the first one I'm going to kind of roll out there is the Colorado Police Department encrypts all radio communications. And this is out of Graham Cluley, and I've got the link you'll see in the show notes and also be in the slides as well. But uh, Graham Cluley talks about this where there's they, the Colorado Police Department uh, had to actually go out and encrypt their communications channels between the, the squad cars and the actual uh, squad or squadron. You know, that's I look in military terms. And what they had to do is they did that because of all of the apps that were intercepting and eavesdropping on their communications. And so, therefore, when someone was going through a crime and they were trying to go and talk back and forth with the police department, uh, they ran into issues around that capability. So, bottom line is, is that they they did some level of encryption on that. Now, the interesting part around that was, is that in the military, I actually had that challenge. Uh, we would we would have a certain encrypted communications when we were flying airplanes and we would talk between ourselves we'd have to link and sync up between the airplanes and they'd have to have a code that you'd put in and then that when that would happen is is your airplanes could talk amongst each other encrypted well so now it's moved from basically being in airplanes to now the situation rolls into is you've got police departments that have it so it's kind of interesting how the world has changed dramatically from uh it used to be in the past but uh it's it's just kind of cool how the technology is continually morphing and changing and it's actually changing in this case it's not necessarily they're bad people they're just people trying to get the scoop uh but the police department don't want that to impact their investigation so therefore they do these kind of things so it's kind of it's kind of cool uh but you can check that out at graham clearly will have that uh that overall article in there on their website now, as regards to DHS, so DHS issues an emergency directive. And what exactly is that? Well, recently there's been some DNS hijacking campaigns that have been going on. And we talked about those, I think it was last week or the week before last, about what was happening. And bottom line is they believe there's some Iranian hackers that are working as a state sponsored that are actually going out and, and hijacking DNS names. So in the process of doing that, what they do is they then can redirect the traffic to where they want it to go. So they basically impersonate that DNS name. Uh, so what ended up happening is the federal government decided, the U.S. federal government, to issue an emergency directive to enable some some capabilities within the, the government to start looking at this and auditing what they had in place from the DNS standpoint. So they, they're able to intercept, forward, and record network traffic, obviously, right? But they can. They, what has happened is, is they've been phishing the registrar information, and then they go in and change that information. So the DNS no longer points to where you want it to point to. It points to their DNS servers. Um, so that's how they're able to then they copy your site, they act and look like your site, and then they can com, uh, copy the information that's being sent to it or being added into it. So it's kind of an interesting attack that's that's going on. Um, and obviously they've had some issue with it. I know there's some creds that have been compromised for the US government and um, FireEye had mentioned that and they had talked about it with them. 
so they they enabled um, CISA. Now, what CISA is is it's the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure and Security Agency. Okay, big word or big not word, lots of words, but basically a big title. Um, and they were formed in November 18th, 2018. Uh, under Obama had actually signed the order to have it put in place. They finally turned it on in November of 2018. So it's really not that old. It's only like three months old. Um, and they have the authority to basically go out and audit all these DNS servers. And so I'm, you can only imagine the size of the U.S. government is monstrous. And so therefore finding these DNS servers and figuring out who are the, the, uh, the authoritative and the secondary DNS servers, who has those, how are they protected? Um, and it's they've also said that it has to be completed by February 5th. So at the, the doing of this podcast, uh, there's probably about maybe... Oh, I don't know what you would think, probably two weeks before the February 5th timeline. So that is not a lot of time for them to get this done. So uh, hopefully they got a lot of people working on it. So with the government shutdown, you just never know (laughs) what's going on with that. Um, So anyway, you can check that out. Uh, It'll be interesting to see where that goes and what they dig up. Usually when they do an audit, just usually when you find things that are not necessarily correct and then it kind of changes the dynamic just a little bit. So uh, that is the cybersecurity news around DHS emergency directive and then also around the Colorado Police Department. So let's roll on to the next one. So five stages of a CISO's success. Now, this is out of dark reading. And I thought it was kind of interesting because uh, if you're a person that's listening to this podcast, you obviously are probably a small, medium-sized business that is looking for cybersecurity stuff to help you out um, or and also potentially to train some of your your employees uh, or if you're a security person who's looking to get the next certification obviously the, the CISSP or something like that you're you're tuning in well one of the things is is the ultimate goal if you're a security professional is to become the quote-unquote CISO for a company and what the dark reading did is they walked through the various stages of what the CISOs have done over time so this basically starts back in the 1990s and works its way up to today, which is the two, the two twenty. What is it? 2018, 19, 19. It's almost 2020. So it's from the 1990s to 2020. So you got talking almost 30 years, right? 25 years. And that is a long time ago. <laughs> this is, I can't even believe how fast the time went. But so they talk about five stages and this is like not the five stages of Hades or anything like that. This it could be, I guess, if you have a really bad day and you get breached, but it's the five stages of where they've seen CISOs morph over time. Um, and they had a, a, a 2019 CISO roundtable or advisory group, and they, they had a response to where it's been and, or what where it was and where it's at today. So stage one, the number uno, numero, numero uno, uh, is basically for the, about the first five years of the whole CISO piece. And they really came out, the CISO started around 1995 to 2000 is when they started kind of coming up on the scene. Um, and they were limited in their security posture based upon mostly on login and password, right? So that was what majority of the people uh, were dealing with at the time. So that was the 1990s, the 2000s. That has now changed dramatically to the point where uh, it's not just logins and passwords that you're dealing with for around security. Uh, and so they that was the whole focus at that point was pretty much just making sure everybody's got passwords. And the other aspect around it was that I, the, the CISOs were not really part of the equation as it came to senior leaders. Uh, it was more of an additional add-on to IT. And we'll honestly, we'll see that kind of going through most of the stages up until we get to about stage four and stage five is when the CISO starts to kind of come out of that shell. But something to kind of consider around that. Uh, stage two is the regulatory and compliance era. So this is something where more regulations were coming into place, uh, privacy regulations. And so therefore the security officer, the security person within the organization has to get smart on what is that uh, and, and understanding the, the compliance aspects. So it was more regulations uh, as they came into the privacy piece. But now as, as time has gone on, so from that era to now today, uh, we all know that the regulations and the compliance piece is extremely large. Um, it's not actually even one where you can just go, hey, I've only got a couple regulations to worry about or a couple compliance things to deal with. It is continually expanding and it's going beyond what it ever was. Uh, I, I get into privacy. I get into uh, cybersecurity regulations. I get into um, data breach. You know, all those things that you would that normally would potentially be just in, in certain areas. 
as a security officer, you get you got to cover everything, and you at least got to be able to discuss it. Now, it doesn't mean you have to know it, but you better be able to discuss it and understand what exactly is occurring. The other on stage three, they they came out as being a risk oriented approach. So between two thousand four to two thousand eight, it became more risk based, and so they they said that, and we've seen this in the past. It was like, okay, I'm going to try to protect everything. But when I was in the military, that was the point too. You can spend gazillions of dollars, but billions and billions of dollars to try to protect it, and it's not going to matter, right? They, they just need to get in once. Well, then they changed the orientation to go from basically being, I want to protect it all, i.e. stage one and two, to being more of a risk-based approach. Now, I'll challenge that a bit in the fact that they say it's 2004 to 2008. I, I personally think it's probably gone beyond that. From my experience, it was more like in the 2010s, 11s before I started seeing change in that. However, um, that's when they expected that that's when they see the changes occurred for risk based uh, stage four is threat aware cybersecurity. Again, now you're dealing with between 2008 to 2016, which isn't that long ago. You've got social, you got mobile, you've got cloud, you've got everything on top of all the other stages that you have to deal with. So these are all cumulative, right? Stage one, two and three. These are things you're still doing today. They haven't changed. Now, with that being said, we're trying to automate some of this piece and try to help with uh, at least number one, trying to get some of that away from having to worry about it too much. But at the end of the day, you still have to know one through four at this point. So that's threat aware, cybersecurity, social, mobile, and cloud. Okay, now stage five, privacy and data aware. Uh, as a good friend of mine said, and I've talked about this in some of the CISSP training that I've done, is it's all about the data. And you have to know where the data is going, who has the data, who's touching the data, it all comes down to that. So that's stage five, privacy and being data aware. Uh, we were just talking to some individuals today about uh, data lakes, you know, and so how do you deal with that? You've got Amazon and Azure, they've got these monster data lakes and you got data going into them. How do you manage that? How do you protect it? How do you keep it from somebody falling in the wrong hands? And then you got to, the people that have access to it, they can run all kinds of reports off stuff. So then how do you deal with that? So these are all little things that you're going to have to roll into as a security person um, around, the, especially if you get into more of a managerial role or more of a leadership role. These are all the things you're going to have to deal with. However, it doesn't have to be a managerial or a leader to be able to deal with those things. I mean, as a security analyst, you deal with those. I mean, I dealt with those back when I was just even working as a hacker, you see it. But it has changed. It's morphed substantially from what the CISOs were in the past. Uh, so the whole point of this this article was just to kind of tell you how things continue to change. The one part they mentioned in there that is pretty much spot on is the fact that you're just going to have to adjust and you're going to have to morph with the times. Uh, the, the biggest part around this, though, is you do not have the luxury to basically sit back and not want to learn. You have to learn. Um, and I know I'm already for, uh, way behind in some things that I need to be just because it's changing so quick. So again, that's around the cybersecurity news. So we've talked about police officers encrypting their communications, right? Talked about DHS and the challenges that DHS has had recently with the DNS hijacking that's going on. And then we just talked about the five stages of CISO success, not the five stages of Hades, but the five stages of CISO success. All right, so that's what we got for round going on for security news. Let's go ahead and roll right into our training. Okay, this is part of our CISSP supplement, and this is Understanding Cybersecurity Frameworks, Part 1. All right, Part Uno. All right, so as we're talking about cybersecurity frameworks, we're going to get into the how you, what do they mean? And we're basically going to go into the fact of how do you unwrap these? What do they actually I mean, what does it mean, right? Um, and, and because of my third grade education and what I struggle with as far as just common sense things, um, I had to break this down into a point where I could actually understand it. Because I kept hearing all these security folks talking, you talk about a framework. Do you have a framework? I have a framework. We have a framework. Everybody has a framework. Frameworks are important. And I'm like, what the heck is a framework? So to me, it's like I'm going to build a building and maybe build a uh, hog confinement. So from Iowa, I can have some pigs in there. That's a frame. And I got to build a frame around it. And, and I got to work to do it. So there you go. Yeah. Building a hog confinement. That's a framework. No, that's not true. OK, so what's the purpose of a framework? Well, it is a guidepost. OK, it's a guidepost to guide you where you need to go. No, it's a guidepost to secure your environment. The whole purpose of it is, is that you need to look at how do you secure your environment? OK, so if you don't know what to do, 
So let's just say you are Billy Bob, and Billy Bob has no idea what to deal with around security. He knows the terms, basically, and he knows that he should do some stuff, but he doesn't really know what, what he should do beyond that. And so therefore, how do I do it? Well, that's where the frameworks come into play. And they're really useful, especially when you're dealing with frame frameworks that are more simple, uh, but they can also have some that are more complex. Um, ISO 27001 is an example of that, which will just make, basically make your eyes bleed. Um, so the point of it is, is that you will uh, need to have a framework, especially if you're putting some level of security within your organization. It's also designed to meet some level of compliance requirements. As an example, um, there was a recent law that's been passed. I think it was in Alabama or South Carolina. Well, South Carolina had one for sure. Um, and the fact of it is, is that you didn't have to have, are you, it was for insurance agencies. And these insurance agencies have had a certain amount of people, and I think we've talked about on the podcast, uh, a certain amount of people within your organization is basically a certain size, or you have a certain number of clients. You must follow some strict criteria. And of these criteria, one of them is to have a security program in place. And what they say is that if you follow a security framework for this, uh, then therefore that will help meet the overall goal of, of the law. So the frameworks are just help to guide people in the right direction and what to do. However, if you're a person that's not a security person, you're going to read this stuff and go, what in the world are they saying? And I'm a security person, and sometimes I scratch my head going, I have no idea what you're saying. It's because, again, third grade education does get in the way just a little bit. So that those are some of the things around the frameworks. Uh, as an example, and there's many use cases, but the New York Department of Financial Services, NDY, or NYDFS, uh, they, they have some high regulations around financial institutions by the state of New York. And therefore, one of those is that you must have some level of security in place following a framework to do so. So this is how they do it. Uh, Massachusetts 201 CMR 17.00. OK, that just came out recently um, and that hit the book, hit the streets, I think last week. Uh, but basically comes right down to is that if you have anybody that's a Massachusetts resident and you get a, a breach within your organization, there are some certain things you have to do. Uh, one is the fact that you got to give uh, credit freezes to people, you got to give credit monitoring to people, so, you know, the standard fare around that. Um, but bottom line, you got to do that. Now, but you also have to have the ability to, they have to have a written security program in place. Um, and I, I, the way I read it, it sounds like you just, as long as you, you're working in that direction, you're okay, but it's still a little fuzzy to me. Bottom line is, is that they want you to have some documented written information security program that you need to follow. Well, frameworks are a great way to do that. Um, and therefore it kind of points you in the right direction. So that's a framework rough idea not a hog confinement but a framework in cybersecurity. okay so so what are some available frameworks for you to play with um there's really about big the big five i call them um there's way more than just five obviously but there are some that a majority of the people utilize these frameworks and the first one is pci dss uh, this is the payment card industries uh data secure data security standards um and it's part of the the PCI S, S C C or C C S S something like that. Um, but bottom line is those that's the payment card. Credit card stuff goes goes through PCI. ISO twenty seven thousand one. This is defined by the International Standard uh, International Organization for Standardization, uh, and therefore you follow that standardization for organization that organization standardization. You follow that, and that works out really well from an organ from a global standpoint to be able to follow this framework. Uh, they are different. So PCI DSS is different than ISO 27001, and it's different than some of the NIST frameworks that are out there. Uh, just a couple that I have sitting out is the 853, which is around security and privacy controls for federal information systems and organizations. And then there's the 800 protected controlled unclassified information in non-federal systems and organizations. Yeah, it's a lot to say. Uh, and then the, finally, the one that actually I think has got the most meat behind it. I mean, they all do, but I mean, the one that I feel is probably the easiest to be adopted by many is the cybersecurity framework. They typically call it the Charlie Sierra Foxtrot. Okay. Um, and in that you have, it's, it, they fall, fall in line, but it used to come out of the critical infrastructure framework. And if you can follow that, and it, it does, it's got some really good pieces in there to help you with your organization to walk you through what you should do to best protect your data. So, those are some of the, the key frameworks right there. There's three of them. We'll get into the next one here. 
High Trust is the Health Information Trust Alliance. And I talk about this in my C in the CISSP course that I put out there. Uh, but High Trust, COBIT, Control Objectives for Information and Related Technologies. Um, so those are those are some big the big five in that place. And they're all really important to do. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll into one as a use case, and then you can kind of see how how that plays out. So the use case one I have is PCI standards, payment card industry standards that are set up PCI DSS. Um, I should just say PCI security standards. Now, there's technical and operational requirements that you have to put in place, and this is managed by the PCI Security Standards Council. And you, so what it comes down to is, is you have to have a firewall. You have to have operational ways to manage the firewall. You have to have a way to manage your ch change of management, management of change, so forth. So there's there's different types of PCI uh, standards that are available. One is the PCI PTS. Okay, that's the for manufacturers. Um, now, from a flying standpoint, I'm going to go back to my days when I say PTS. It's just like whoa, you know, it's like that you, the way back machine that just flips you back, and you're going, oh yeah, I remember a much better time in my life. Uh, no, it is the uh, practical test standards by the FAA. So when you flew airplanes, you had to do a practical test standards. Well, that's not where PCI is. Yeah, this is a different animal, uh, but that's for manufacturers. There's a PCI PA-DSS, and that's the software development aspect around PCI development. So how do you manage your, your credit cards and how, what kind of the software development around your credit cards? That is all the PCI PA-DSS. However, there is a change to that that's coming, and we will get into that in just a minute. Then there's the PCI DSS, which is for your merchants and service providers. This is the typical one that you get for anybody from, I don't know, um, your Olive Garden, your restaurants, your gas stations, um, your daycares, you name it. They all have that if they take a credit card, they all have to fall under the PCI DSS. Now, there's some key components. Now, these are just a few that I'm throwing out there of the DSS. Again, again we talked about technical and operational pieces of this, but they have firewall configurations. So you need to know how to configure your firewalls or you need to pay someone to do it for you. Uh, and they do give you some guidance around how you should protect those and what are some key things you should configure your firewall for. There also are people out there that are certified in PCI assessors and so forth, and they can give you some guidance around that as well. You need to avoid vendor default passwords. That's a given, right? So if you get a machine and it's got a password and its default is quote unquote password, you, they don't want that. You don't want passwords from somebody else because guess what? What I used to do in a previous life is we would then Google, this is before Google was really, really, really cool. We would Google what are the uh, standard manuals for, let's just say, some Linksys router. Well, it tells me right in there what is the standard username and password to get into this Linksys router. Well, great. I already know it. So now I'm good. So those same default vendor passwords are everywhere. And if they're default, guess they're on the internet. They're, everybody has available to, availability to them. So you want to avoid those at all costs. Now, you also want to encrypt your transmissions of data. Any data that's transmitted, you want to make sure it's encrypted. Protecting the stored cold heart. Now, this is the other part that I thought was interesting. Protect stored cold, cold card holder data. They don't say how you should. So you got the first one says encrypt transmissions of data. Second one says, quote unquote, protect stored cardholder data. What the heck does that mean? Well, I think there's some interpretation there, right? So how are you protecting it? Well, I've got a username and password to get into the system that holds that data. Okay, so it's you're protecting it, right? But the username and password, the password is password or monkey or something like that. Yeah, that's not really that effective. So the key question around that is, is there's many, many components to the PCI uh, that you can definitely get into. And I highly recommend looking on YouTube uh, for some options around that, but also get yourself a professional to help you if that is your livelihood. So around compliance aspects. Now, there are tools available from the credit card companies to help you ensure that you meet compliance around PCI. Uh, they got scan tools. They got all kinds of stuff that, that are available to you to use because the credit card companies, they don't want you to basically give up your ghost on these cards. They, they want to keep the cards, right? It costs them a lot of money when they have to go reissue new cards. They have to cancel accounts and blah, 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 blah. All that stuff is a pain in the patootie for them. So therefore, they don't want to deal with it. Uh, so therefore, they provide some tools for you as the merchant to help you with that. Now, from a qualified assessor standpoint, there are different assessors. So there's different capabilities within the PCI that help you evaluate the, the capability. 
There's qualified security assessors. Okay, these are approved to validate the adherence to the PCI DSS. So it's basically like an auditor, right? They, they, they come in, they audit you to make sure you're meeting the requirements based on what the PCI DSS states. Uh, there's also approved scanning vendors. So you have, if you have an external facing website, you have to have your uh, website scanned and they don't want you just going out to Billy Bob scanning the market and doing it. They want you to have an approved scanning vendor that you go through to do the scanning of your websites. So again, that's all your internet facing stuff. Now, um, PCI security standard.org has a lot of reference materials you can refer and reference back to, to help you with securing your, your site. But again, those are some key places to kind of consider uh, PCI security standard.org and you have your assessors and your scanning vendors. Now there's a self-assessment questionnaire and we're going to kind of get into that here in a minute. Um, what, before I do that, there's the network configuration piece of this is also you need to understand that you need to do this. Now you can self-help it, you can do it yourself, but it's probably not the best option. So if there's any sort of configuration that needs to occur, you probably need to pay someone to help you with it. And the reason I say that is because it, it potentially increases your liability uh, in the event something goes sideways. Uh, you should outsource it, find reputable parties. You need to understand the regulation around PCI though. You can't just say, hey, Bill, you're a PCI certified dude. Go do it for me. And Bill goes, sure, I'll do it. Well, then Bill misses something and next thing you know, you're getting sued. Um, and in the case of the credit card companies, if, if you don't take it seriously, they just turn off your ability to, to use a credit card. Well, in today's world, if you don't have a credit card reader of some kind, that is bad. That makes you're going out of business, baby. So um, something to consider around that. Now, the self-assessment questionnaire, there's some various questionnaires that, that PCI puts together for you, uh, the PCI security standards.org, uh, to help you with this. And the first one is a self-assessment questionnaire A. Now, it says, oh, sorry, didn't mean to yawn on you. Um, so what it says is a cards are not present, mer uh, are card not present merchants and all cardholder data are outsourced. So what does that mean? That means that everything is outsourced. You don't have to, they don't keep anything and you have a third party that does it. So when it comes to the information, nothing's staying resident within your system. So that, but you still need to follow the SAQ-A. Even if you don't take, even if the credit cards aren't store, stored on your system, you need to follow it. A good example would be WordPress maybe, uh, or a website that you may have, and you use an iframe that will then take the data and ship it off for you. Um, technically with an iframe, you don't have to have the full up PCI evaluation. You can go to an abbreviated version like the SAQ-A because the credit card is never res resident within your system. It's migrated off to uh, the, the payment card company. So again, we talked about SAQ. Is cars not present? Merchants, all that data, all that stuff is outsourced. Uh, SAQ-B is basically imprint only merchants, no electronic card holders. So that's the old style where you got a card down and you go, crunk, crunk, you know, you, you back and forth. And if you're probably younger than 30, you're going, I have no idea what he just said. The bottom line is you have a carbon copy. They, they copy your credit card, they charge it. And then what ends up happening is they send it into the credit card company. Um, <clears throat> if you're a merchant, it's a good way for you to get taken because what ends up happening is you run the card and then there's no money. The guy's gone, you know, so it's, it's actually, it's, it's good that you use electronics. So if you can use it, I'd recommend it. Now, merch, the SAQCVT, uh, merchants using only web-based virtual terminals, no electronic storage. Okay. So if you're using a web-based virtual terminal of some kind, uh, then that way, uh, that one will fall into you. SAQD is all other merchants not including in the description for SAQ uh, A through C and then all service providers. So if you're a service provider, you got to do it. If you're SAQ dash A through C, you got to do it or you do not have to do it. But it's it's basically that's the full the full thing you got to go through. The whole shoot and shoot and caboodle is in that there. Now, there's templates and checklists to go through this on addressing these capabilities, and I would recommend that you go online and see what you can find to help you with it. Uh, I was just looking at the site and they have a whole laundry list of things that you can go through and check in the box on that. Now, the only downside of that is, is you're going to have to understand the technical terms behind it. Cause if you don't understand it, it's just basically kind of useless. Uh, so make sure that you, wh whoever does the configuration for you, uh, you understand and they understand what what's needed. All right. So this is the references I've got for uh, this uh, broadcast slash podcast. And what we've got is it's uh, IT governance has got some great stuff out there. The NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, Cali Picks security, tenables trends around 
Security Frameworks Adoption Surveys, PCI Security Standards, and Interactive Application Security Testing. Now, that was part one, part uno. We're going to have part two will be coming up here uh, next week. We'll have that aspect added to it as well. The reason I did that, I broke it up, is because uh, if not, the podcast would be about an hour and a half long. And I, all I know is my ADD lasts about 5.2 seconds. And if I go longer than that, then everybody's leaving. Well, if I know if I add both together, yeah, we'll have a whole lot of people gone. So we're breaking them into two. You'll like it. It'll be awesome. But we'll just do as very similar as we have today. All right. Thanks so much for joining me here at Reduce Cyber Risk. We greatly appreciate it. Hope everything goes well for you. And uh, catch us on the flip side. See ya. Thanks so much for joining me today on my podcast. If you like what you heard, please leave a review. And as I would greatly appreciate any and all feedback. Also, check out my videos that are on YouTube. Just search for Sean Gerber and you will find a plethora of content to help you secure your business. Lastly, head on over to Reduce Cyber Risk and look at all the free stuff that's available for our email subscribers. It's growing each and every day. Thanks again for listening. See ya.